about it's a very important <laughs> topic. It's a basically a simple art in the social world. And this is a basically a building blocks of a major advanced AI surgery. And if for any advanced AI surgery, you should be knowing about the natural medicine and services. And with adequate supervision, and if you have a good sound foundations, even a training can produce a results which is comparable with its damage surface. People started with diagnosis. They were very often. Surgeons were very often. And it's and every surgeon they used to have their own techniques and they used to keep it. Very fancy names for that. But with progress of time, the uh, increasing knowledge, increase, increasing knowledge of physiology, anatomy, and the uh, anastomosis procedure became simplified and simplified. Nowadays, we usually do a single layer anastomosis, and even with the technical advancement, people are doing a stapler anastomosis. Even then, the era of traditional anastomosis. Started around 300 bags year back by a British veterinary surgeon. When this also reflects that why we should publish our findings, our any cases why we should publish. 300 years back, a veterinary surgeon, a British veterinary surgeon, he published a report. What he did was to say he was called for the obstruction, probably obstruction of the eyes of an ox by a farmer. He opened the abdomen, he set a gangrenous bowel, he resected the bowel, did the anastomosis over some form of stent. The ox passed the stent after one or two days. Then that cattle that gradually improved. And so the era of GI anastomosis started. And that was the time when India was still governed by Mughals and the Americans they were still ruled by British and French. That was long back. Similarly, in 1727, there was a surgeon called Ramkar. He came across a young lady who came with a ruptured inguinal abscess. And on further examination, he found out it was a strangulated inguinal arachnia and there was a gangrenous ball. He resected the ball and simply he invaginated the two, two ends with few simple sutures. And luckily the girl survived. Unfortunately and for fortunately for the surgeon, the lady died after two years and the people they did autopsy and they found that the anastomosis was perfect. That was another milestone. So, we had a very gradual evolution. The surgeon were fearful. They had a fear of opening the abdomen. They were fear. They had a fear of opening the peritoneum. They think that when we <coughs> open the abdomen, it causes peritonitis. But around 200 years back, a famous surgeon, Lembard, he, pro he proposed Zero muscular suture in the wall. It was in 1826. That was the modern era of GI anastomosis. Then, by 1990s, after the advent of antisepsis, anesthesia, GI surgery was progressive in lips and bones. There were many great surgeons like Langenbach, Kupfer, Sarset, they all contributed. And in 1926, the vascular anastomosis was also introduced. Connell's introduced a popular technique, Connell's suturing in 1963. And then now the, the, the most popular current technique is the Matheson, which was published in 1975, of ex, where he proposed an extra universal interrupted single layer anastomosis. And that's the now gold standard of a GI anastomosis. Now the question is, how often does it leak? The various reporters, various publics, they say it ranges from 1 to 24 percent. 
but there are many gray areas there are many gray areas and you can you also have many white areas but if it leaks if it leaks it's a black area for the surgeon and for the patient therefore why should we care why should i care if it why when it leaks why should we care because the leak leads to longer hospital stay it increases the higher mortality it has a the patient has a higher readmissions higher higher re operations patient has a poor quality of life there is a risk of distal recurrence and patient has a delay in receiving enhancement chemotherapy Similarly, this leak is not going to disappear from our field. The, 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 this issue will remain and will, will, will likely to persist in the foreseeable future as well. And when the leak occurs, it's very difficult to manage and of course it's very frustrating to the surgeons. It's frustrating to the operating surgeons, into the resident, interns and all the team. There is a cloud of anxiety. So how can we achieve a good anastomosis? It's basically a three-pronged approach. We should have a good surgical anatomical knowledge. We should have a robust technical expertise and training. And of course, we should have a fine clinical judgment. These are the three pillars of a good anastomosis. It was, it is, and it will. And as I have already said, the intestinal healing it mimics the wound healing as well in the body, and we can divide it into a three phases: it's the acute inflammatory phases, which last phase which lasts for around seven days, proliferative phase which lasts for three weeks, three to four weeks, and the maturation phase it goes on mostly for months. This, these are the four layers of a bowel. And the most important one, with view of a anastomosis, is the submucosa, because it provides the tensile strength. Unless I have some more facts, when you do an anastomosis, the 60% of the strength it reaches within three, three to four days, and by 100%, by one week, the tensile strength reaches to 100%. And the collagen is the utmost important. It's the most important protein for body building. As I have said, submucosa is the strongest layer, and visceral peritoneum it greatly influences the healing. This is a human body, and this human body is, in fact, an aggregation of a vascular species. It's a place of many areas where you have a low blood supply. And for good sound healing, as elsewhere, the bowel also need a good bowel supply. Sorry, good blood supply. And what are the tricks for good blood supply? When you are operating, always look for the vessels in the mesenteri before choosing a resection site. Always ensure pink mucosa, bright red bleeding from the arterial vessels in the submucosa. Think always before cutting colon, and think blood supply to the colon is always precarious. And if you have any doubt, if you have any suspicion for a blood supply, always opt for side to side anastomosis if it's possible. And always, always avoid this dusky green, pink mucosa and dark is of minus magnetic from the cuts of the subtomorrow before you embark in the journey of anastomosis. Nowadays, there are technology, technologies are also helping surgeons, especially in a, when surgeons are doing a laparoscopic surgery, they can inject a dye and go for an intraoperative fluorescent imaging. There are two systems, spy system, firefly system, which helps <coughs> to, resect, to delineate the a vascular area in the bowel. And the studies have shown that around 5 to 40 percent change in the bowel. Then another important thing is you should always avoid tension 
Why not for an anastomosis? Because tensors, as you know, it increases the tensor, it causes disruption, and you should consider various factors. You see, that increases tension, like the tension may increase due to post-operative swelling, due to the IVS, change in the body position, or even a bowel feeling. The, the, when it feels, the tension inside, inside the bowel may increase, and that increases the risk of this disruption. So, if you have a doubt, always mobilize the ink without damaging a blood supply to decrease the tension between the two adjoining bowel. So, the general rules are this, this applies for all the surgery good exposure, good mobilization, and a good dissection. That's the most important thing. Always, when you divide a mesenteri, you should always be careful. Always clear the fat and epi appendix epiduracy of the colon before doing an astromosis. Think of, when you die, think always risk of simply slippage of the ligases. Therefore, you should, you, the careful placement of ties is very important because when you sleep, the mesentery, in the mesentery, there may be a hematoma and in the post-operative period, it may decrease the blood supply to the anastomosis, anastomosis side and threatening the bowel viability. Always minimize fecal contamination. So, always use bowel cams, isolate your playing field and with use of ample packs and tetras. So, in general, how in the real, how is this different in different tissues? If you look at this table, small intestine is the safest one. The leak rate is very low, 1 to 3%, 3, 1 to 4%. But when you go to the arts, the proximal and distal intestine, the, the rate increases. In esophagus, it's around 10 to 40%. In a low rectum, it's around 13 to 19%. Always consider this fact before doing an astromosis. And the, there are many patient adjustable factors which plays role in a, an astromosis healing. And unfortunately for the surgeons and a whole medical team, this is a quite frustrating thing. Because most of them are unalterable and unmodifiable. Even then, you have to think, you have to think before doing the anastomosis whether the patient is having a good supply or not. And if the patient has these factors, can you can we go for the proximal dry version? Or rather than making a stoma, could we make a permanent stoma? You should think about this. If the patient has these non-adjustable risk factors like abdominal ascites, advanced malignancy, patient with alcohol abuse, anemia, diabetes, history of cardiovascular disease, smoking history, male sex, eye, ASA score, renal failure, and tumor size. These are the few non-adjustable risk factors. Can you prevent bowel anastomosis now? Sorry, can you prevent bowel leak after the anastomosis? These are the few modifiable risk factors we can think. Nutrition, steroids, good nutrition, stoppage of steroids, stop, stopping smoking after 5 minutes, and timing of chemotherapy before the resection. That's also important. Another important factor is the mechanical bowel protection. This is traditionally we have been preparing bowel with the oral antibiotics and uh, various um, bowel cleaning agents. But nowadays the mechanical bowel preparation is again losing its same because of many studies they showing that there is a patient dissatisfaction, electrolyte disbalance, and potential risk of posterior difficult in infection. People are again going back just to the oral antibiotics and a simple decrease in fecal load rather than going for a full mechanical bowel preparation. That's also important part. Another important part is the hypotension. If the patient has a hypotension in the preoperative period, sorry, in the intraoperative period, the risk is very high. 
and if the patient receives some vascular pressure, the risk increases by three to four folds. Another important thing is giving a fluid. How much fluid to give? Whether we should go with a over treatment or under treatment. It's a big controversy. And nowadays the, 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 the knowledge is shifting to our giving a less fluid. Similarly, the blood transfusion, it also increases the risk. Perioperative blood transfusion increases the risk by 10 times. The horse ratio is 10. And always aim for the restrictive transfusion. What about Ryan's tube? There is no significant aim. Reduction in the risk of leakage, but people who, but but nearly 20% of the patient required HA tube in the early post-operative period. You have to think the for the patient who were not the for the patient who were not operated for the rise tube, 20% required again rise tube. Friends, there is a whole dictum: when in doubt, drain. That what we are taught nowadays is it is impossible to drain the abdomen. That's the new dictum. So, brains, it increases the incidence of anastomotic diseases. It does not improve outcome or reduce the complication with prophylactic brains. And in fact, it, it may cause severe inflammation at the anastomosis site. But brains are helpful when we are doing it, when we are doing surgery for the emergency operation. For a trauma or in a peritonitis or in a pelvis after the anterior dissection or colloidal anastomosis. So, the great debate is for an anastomosis is whether we go, should go for a single or double layer, whether we should go for a continuous or interrupted suture, eversion or inversion of a suture, and what should be the choice of a suture material, and whether it should be a stable or a an anastomosis. That's another debate. Basically, we prefer nowadays people prefer single layer because it's a, it uses less operative time, less narrowing of the intestinal lumen. There is a more rapid vascularization of the mucosal healing. There is a rapid increase in strength of the anastomosis in for, within a few days, and there is an early return of normal bowel function compared with the double layer anastomosis. And what is the ideal solution? The ideal solution should have a minimum inflammation and tissue reaction and it should provide a maximal strength during the last black phase that's the first phase of the mood healing so mono, monofilament or a coated braided sutures are the most effective ones that interrupted sutures are better than continuous ones because continuous sutures are associated with lower perianastomostic oxygen tension and less narrow in the Sometimes we have a problem of a diameter issue. One, of, one end of the bowel is great, bigger and another is smaller. Then in a hands and anastomosis we can give a oblique division of the ends or we can cut back the division of the borders. Or we can go with a side to side anastomosis or sometimes we may even intubate, temporarily intubate the bowel. People have applied 50 degrees. And buttressing of the anastomosis in the effects of factors is people have found in some studies is is helpful and it has decreased anastomotically. Now another important part is the stepper. When the stepper first arrived, it was around 3.6 kg and it took two hours to load. It was in 1908. <coughs> These staples they are made up from a titanium clips, but sometimes they may have a nickel. And some people they may be allergic to the nickel. <coughs> this issue is important. Some most patient has a issue with some jewelry. You should try to elicit that issue. And they are those are not magnetic. We have three types of basically three types, four types of staples, transverse and astromatic staples. This is the simplest type. Then we have a linear cotter, circular stepping device, which has revolutionized the lower isophysal and sorry, lower rector and isophysal and as much. This is not only about the types of stepper, the size of the stepper length is also important because. 
different tissues they have a different thickness and even a even a stomach it has a very very thickness from the cardia up to the pylorus you should think about the thickness people have used many surgeons who have used I have seen many surgeons using such a reinforcement after taking after a stable anastomosis people use by observable suture lines and this stepping is going to increase in in 2000 it was only a 100 million market in 2015 it was a 3.4 billion market and it's increasing with a rate of around 8% so what are the advantages of doing stable anastomosis it provokes minimal inflammatory response compared with anterior anastomosis it provides better support in the weakest phase of healing it shortens the operating time it has a lower recurrence rate at the stable line so what is a good anastomosis and what good anastomosis requires it requires an adequate exposure and access it requires a gentle handling of the bowel a well vascularized bowel there should be no tension a good technique and finally there should be no fecal contamination the ideal anastomosis is should have a zero leg liquids should promote early recovery and function there should be no vascular compromise not narrowing of the lumen of the vein it should be easy to tease and technique should be fairly quick to perform and surgeons we are still searching for it the ideal anastomosis so finally any anastomosis no matter how technically sound on creation may fall always think of this and always think of diagnosis before closing the abdomen thank you ladies and gentlemen for your attention